Well, it was an interesting time because it was the first single member district election that we had in, in the, for the Oregon legislature. So the, these, the, the boundaries of each district were actually new uh, during the 1972 election. And as a result uh, of that change, there were a lot of vacancies, a lot of seats that were open during the 72 election. I was one of 28 freshmen out of 60. The old adage about freshmen having to stay in the background and wait their turn, there were too many of us that they couldn't do that. And the feminist movement was erupting. And so the fact that women were running was really an important element. This was, uh, I think, the first year when you had a fair number of women legislators. Little did I know what historic session that was going to turn out to be. It was the first time the Democrats had held both the Senate and the House for 20 years or so. There was an enormous overlap in those days of liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. It was more of a conservative liberal thing or a rural urban thing than it was a Democrat Republican thing. Politics inside the legislature is different from external politics. It's on a much more personal level. It's, it has to do with the relationships you build with one another, and at least at that time, less to do with your partisan alliance. That session had so many other things going on, though. There was Senate Bill 100, there was the Equal Rights Amendment, there was marijuana, small quantity legalization, lots of those kind of issues that were iconic kind of issues for the legislature to be dealing with. One major piece of legislation after the other. Well, let's talk about Senate Bill 100. Oh, you want to talk about Senate Bill 100? The lovability and livability of Oregon is made possible, I think, by Senate Bill 100. Right now, if you drive out of Portland, all of a sudden, bang, you're in the country, and uh, that doesn't happen very many places. That's all due to Senate Bill 100. A very significant piece of legislation, not one that I personally supported, however, because of the district that I represented. The argument on behalf of the environmentalists was that uh, you couldn't get meaningful land use reform when you had to go to a county commission, county planning commission, that was beholden to the landowners and that you needed a statewide oversight body that wasn't subject to those pressures. The venality of the average county commission. You'd like a zoning change, you're my brother. You'd like to change the, the, the one-way street to the two-way street, you're my sister. state would make general policy outlines and then the counties would adopt comprehensive plans for their own individual needs, but in those comprehensive plans and their zoning, they had to follow the goals and guidelines set up by LCDC. The Land Conservation Development Commission that is largely responsible today for administering Senate Bill 100. I was on the environmental committee and uh, the bill went to, to that committee and uh, it was uh, it was contentious in any event came for a vote in the committee but Vic Atia, who was on the committee voted with Hector McPherson and it came out and it passed and then I thought uh oh here, here's, here's where I got to really play. 
So we got the bill to sign to Nancy Fadley's House Committee. The bill came over from the Senate, and it had passed by one vote. Ted Hallett came to me and he said that Vicatia had changed his mind and was going to vote no if it came back. So what the way the legislature works, a bill has to pass in exactly the same language in both houses in order to become law. So if it leaves one house, goes to the second house, and amendments made to that bill, then it has to go back to the first house where the first house would agree or not to agree in that, those amendments. So he said, Atiyah will, will not concur and the bill will die. Ted Heller cautioned us not to change a comma of it. No changes, don't change a comma. If you change one comma, Vic Atiyah in the conference committee will screw this bill out of existence and it will vanish. One comma. I implore you to do nothing to this bill. We thought that was going to be a model legislation for the rest of the country. Unfortunately, no, nobody ever uh, took it. it it's a, a tough row to hoe to go against landed interests. And nobody else could quite pull that off in other states. It may be hard to imagine today that women couldn't keep their birth names when they got married, couldn't get credit in their own names, couldn't stay at a motel alone couldn't eat at certain restaurants at lunchtime, couldn't get insurance unless they had a husband, couldn't be admitted to trade schools. The nature of a woman who would run for the legislature at that time uh, was usually uh, somebody who was rather progressive because that isn't something that a, that a woman would do. So we had a lot in common. There were 11 of us that session who just decided that we had to form a really tight coalition in order to accomplish everything that we uh, felt had to be done. We developed a women's caucus, Norma Paulus, Nancy Fadley, Betty Roberts, strong women both on the House and the Senate. So a lot of legislation was passed, many of it dealing with uh, women's issues. One was the um, Equal Rights Amendment that had been sent out by Congress for ratification by the states. And a state after state ratified the, the uh, Equal Rights Amendment, but not enough to get it become part of our Constitution. We women who were working in the caucus then took up various legislation to put the principle of the Equal Rights Amendment into the Oregon statutes. Top priority, our Women's Caucus decided, were the bills that would affect the largest number of women. Those were the proposals prohibiting discrimination in public accommodation, allowing a woman to choose whether to keep her name upon marriage or to return to a former name if divorcing and prohibiting discrimination in educational institutions and in insurance matters. The most important bill was my first bill, which was the extension of the Civil Rights Act to cover gender and sexual orientation. That dropped out very early. A motion to delete the language was what I remember. And it had, drop it, drop it. We need to get the gender it, we'll issue it. We'll get back to sexual orientation. It was a civil rights issue. And we realized that even as early as 73, and it was important to include uh, sexual orientation. In 1866 it was, Oregon ratified the 14th Amendment. And well, there was some controversy on whether or not the two people who voted for it were properly seated. And they were able to unseat them when they came back in 1968, they unratified the, uh, the amendment. And when I found out that it had not been done through the years, it was one of the first things that came to my mind to do. Now, I realize that uh, ratification at this time uh, really has no effect on, on what has been done constitutionally. That's a foregone 
kind of thing. However, I do think because of the the interest and the um, amount of, uh, of hostility that was generated at the time that the state of Oregon unratified, so to speak, the um, the 14th Amendment is is, is with it. So I got on the phone, I talked to some district attorneys around the state, and I say, what happens, a young person gets arrested for a small amount of marijuana, what actually happens to that person? Well, it's a misdemeanor, so they get a criminal record the rest of their life, $100 fine, n no jail time. I talked to Norma Paulus about that, and she said, well, in 1971, they had done a big uh, revision of the criminal code, and one thing they added there, what was called a violation. Now, a violation is an offense that's not a criminal offense, like a traffic ticket, but it does show that something is against the law, it just doesn't give you a criminal record. So I took those ideas together and I put a bill together that said if you get caught with less than an ounce of marijuana, it's going to be a fine of $100, it'll be a violation, so there's no criminal offense. It saved a lot of Oregonian youngsters. Out of the 73 session came a lot of people, a lot of the young legislators who were getting the start in their political careers as young Turks in the 70, were in the 73 session. You know, all of those leaders put a generation of leadership into Oregon government and politics. It was an interesting time in terms of what was going on with women in politics. Uh, it was an interesting time in terms of the legislature just having passed the land use, uh, major land use legislation. Uh, it, was an, it was an interesting time that the legislature was working on things that I was interested in. Uh, 73 was a significant session uh, for, uh, for legislation that, uh, that was futuristic. There never had been before, and I don't think has been since, a session like the 1973 session in terms of major legislation. Mm -hmm.